Hello. Before I begin, I would like to thank the organizers of ILDC for giving me the opportunity to share with you my presentation. My name is Pono Scrivanos, and I work for the Cadassa Foundation as their Senior Manager of Community, Land and Climate. I'm Canadian, and I live on the west coast of British Columbia, and I'm privileged to call or to reside on the homelands of the Wasonic First Nations. Also on my mother's side, my roots and membership with Talaman Nation have provided me with a unique perspective and a profound appreciation for the traditions, values, and stories that shape the communities I work with. I have 20 years of experience working with Indigenous communities and organizations in the areas of mapping and information management. Much of my work has involved collecting various types of data from the field using different kinds of mapping technologies, including GPS devices, airborne and terrestrial LIDAR scanners, and other tools such as Google's Trekker system. I also have experience utilizing drones, both as data collection tools, as well as developing and delivering training specifically targeted for communities and organizations, indigenous communities and organizations. My other area of specialization is in land use and occupancy research. The outputs of these types of research projects are then used for planning purposes, managing natural resources, and for giving those who participate in the process a stronger seat at the negotiation table. In this presentation, I want to share with you my thoughts and ideas on mapping specifically how the use of mapping technologies can be used to assist Indigenous peoples and local communities with their shared quest for rights, preservation, and empowerment. Worldwide, Indigenous people and local communities collectively manage more than half of the world's land. These lands, which include a large proportion of the world's remaining intact forest ecosystems, are vital not only to those who inhabit them, but also to the rest of the world as biodiversity hotspots, their ability to filter pollutants from air and water, and their role as carbon sinks. Unfortunately, many of these areas, including the livelihood of, livelihoods of those who inhabit them, are under enormous pressure from land grabs and other enroachments, deforestation, and especially climate change. And despite strong evidence that granting land rights to Indigenous peoples and local communities is one of the most effective ways of mitigating these threats. It is estimated that land rights are formally recognized only within a fraction of these areas. Documenting where and how Indigenous peoples and local communities use their land, specifically through mapping, I believe is an important step towards ensuring their rightful ownership and protection. Here in India, Forest rights are extremely important for many reasons, including cultural identity, biodiversity conservation, sustainable forest management, just to name a few. The Forest Rights Act of 2006 lays down the legal framework for documenting and recognizing these rights, but there is no single process for documenting these rights. Many, many approaches exist, and these approaches vary from one, another, from one another. So the purpose of this presentation and what I wanna spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about is for me to share some considerations I make when choosing mapping technologies for the purposes, for the purposes of documenting rights and title. And I hope that these considerations that I share with you will help contribute towards wider dialogues on, approach, on approaches that lead to the formal recognition of land rights. Indigenous people have been using maps since time out of mind, though often in forms that differ from the conventional maps that we're familiar with today. These early maps served many purposes, including navigation, resource management, storytelling, and cultural preservation. Some examples include the Nahavo and Anastasi peoples of North America who created rock art featuring maps. Another example is the Aboriginal Australians who used bark maps to represent their ancestral lands. More recently, in the last 30 years or so, advancements in mapping technologies have led to tremendous improvements 
in their availability, functionality, and accessibility. And these technologies now enable Indigenous peoples and local communities to document their lands much more effectively than ever before. In the 1990s, improvements in desktop uh, computing, specifically in memory, memory size and graphics capabilities, increased the availability of software and spatial information. And these advancements provided many Indigenous people and local communities with access to technologies such as GIS, geographic information systems, that could be used to create, analyze, and share digital maps. Then in the 2000s, further advancements, including the availability, including the availability of digital cameras and handheld GPS devices, enabled Indigenous peoples and local communities to monitor their lands more effectively by allowing for the tracking documentation and incorporation of this information into GIS. Additional mapping technologies such as drones, open source software, and artificial intelligence hold the promise of further enabling Indigenous people and in local communities to document their lands. Mapping technologies are no longer a barrier in on themselves to documentation efforts. However, there are other challenges which I want to go through at this point. There currently is no one-size-fits-all approach and many Indigenous peoples and local communities continue to face significant challenges in acquiring, customizing, and utilizing these technologies. One big challenge is that the technology landscape is extensive. It's frankly overwhelming and this can pose challenges for people in, tr in facing the need to select suitable tools and integrating these tools with whatever existing systems and workflows are in place. So making those initial decisions is very hard. Another collection of challenges are security, privacy, and ownership, which I've grouped together. For example, where is the data stored? Is it in or out of the country? Who can access that data? And do Indigenous people and local communities maintain ownership of this data? That's perhaps the most important question of all. There is the challenge of a lack of financial resources to invest in mapping technologies, including purchasing hardware, software, and paying for training that's needed to use these tools. Challenging environments in remote or underserved areas, access to reliable inter internet connection can be limited or non-existent at all, and this can make it challenging to utilize and update mapping technologies effectively. Furthermore, building and customizing technologies to meet specific needs requires very often specialized technical skills. And many Indigenous people in local communities may not necessarily have individuals in their, in their locations with the expertise needed to implement and maintain these technologies. And finally, the last point I want to make here is that many Indigenous people, local communities overlook the importance of information management. This is about how and where information is stored. It's also about how it's integrated with other systems. It's also about who can access this information and most importantly, who is responsible for the information. These are all very important considerations. I just want to talk now about one particular project that I was involved in where many of these challenges came into play. South First Nation of the Coast Salish peoples is a sovereign indigenous nation whose community and traditional territory encompasses the basin surrounding Souk Harbour at the southern end of Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. Their territory contains an abundance of cultural and ecological values, like many places around the world. But their territory is under pressure from many different fronts. For example, resource extraction, forestry and mining and fishing activities, jurisdictional enroachments um, include the assignment of reserves, privatization of land, and also ecological degradations. As such, the documentation of these ecological and cultural values is critical 
to supporting the nation in their efforts to assert land and resource rights within their territory. The project began with a successful acquisition of funding from the provincial government. The nation wanted to collect cultural and ecological knowledge within two recently acquired land parcels within its territory, both of which were poorly documented, increasing use by the public through activities such as hiking and mountain biking makes collecting and documenting these values critical for the nation. However, the nation did not have any existing GIS capacity, nor the tools or processes in place to collect the information they needed to collect. And they also lacked the capacity to effectively manage that information. As such, the project was designed to address several critical capacity gaps. I won't get into the details on these too much, but the three main gaps are a lack of documented cultural and ecological knowledge, a lack of any kind of field data collection system, as well as a lack of a geographic information system that could be used to store, analyze, and display that collected field data. So really the benefits here um, are are many, but they boil down to these three points you see on the slide. This project provided the nation with the tools it needed to facilitate the collection of cultural and ecological knowledge within its territory. It enabled the nation to acquire more knowledge about their land, and it provided the nation with a functioning GIS system capable of managing all of this information. It also helped build awareness both within and outside of the community in terms of the nation's interests, both cultural and ecological. And finally, the information that was collected and the capacity that was built now informs decision making and planning, which are relating to almost all of the community's natural resource management initiatives. So these are my takeaways from this project. I feel like there were some pretty important lessons that were learned. Number one, the system was based on the Open Data Kit platform, also known as ODK, which is free and open source. This is a very, very attractive option for many Indigenous people in local communities. I'm just talking about open source software in general. However, there are often other costs associated with these types of technologies that are not always considered. Open Data Kit is a great platform for certain applications. I won't argue against that. However, in my experience, this and other open source technologies often requires additional resources to set up and customize to meet specific needs. And the expert needed, expertise needed to do so must often be obtained through outside consultants and experts. And of course, this has a cost associated with it. Furthermore, there are often additional software and hardware needs, including computers, phones, tablets, receivers, to name a few, that are often overlooked in that initial cost assessment. The system, number two, the system required significant customization to meet the needs of Selk Nation. So to do this, the nation had to hire a contracted GIS professional to perform these customizations and also to set up, deploy, and provide training. Finally, the last point that I want to make is that is about integration. Integration with other systems is critical. When deciding on what type of technologies to utilize, it's very important that it's compatible both the existing workflow as well as the outputs with other systems already in place. This, I cannot emphasize uh, how important this is. You cannot have a technology that operates in a silo from other tools and workflows that are already in place. Just to wrap all of this up, the pathways that Indigenous people and local communities choose to follow to document their lands are marked by both challenges, but also remarkable progress. There is an amazing array of mapping technologies currently out there. And no matter how specific your needs may be, there is a very good chance that a technology or a collection of technologies 
exists to meet these needs. However, as I've just described, there are still barriers, including financial constraints, infrastructure limitations, data security and privacy concerns, and the complexity of customizing these mapping technologies to meet specific needs must overcome these barriers. And here in India, the importance of documenting forest rights is critically important. And this is why I believe partnerships, partnerships with each other, partnerships with these external uh, organizations, partnerships with, with governments, all different types of partnerships. I believe partnerships are key to overcoming these hurdles and avoiding common pitfalls. We don't need to make mistakes that, are, that have already been made. We can learn from others. The ultimate goal is for Indigenous people and local communities to eventually build the required skills and knowledge to manage their own systems and to have limited external support. But until we get to this place, and as the, la the technology landscape continues to evolve, I believe it's imperative that we are attentive to the needs of Indigenous people and local communities, we build on their knowledge, and we offer ongoing support in terms of training, new tools, and technical support. Thank you very much for providing me with this opportunity to share this with you today. I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity and again would like to thank ILDC, ILDC for accommodating my presentation, especially uh, remotely as I wasn't able to make it there. Cadasta is looking forward to further engagement with partners in India, especially on issues related to land rights. So please, please reach out to me or to Abid if you have any questions or would like to have any further discussions about anything I've shared with you in my presentation today. Thank you very much.